All right, looks like we have some attendees coming in. We'll just give them a few moments before we get started. All right, we can get started. Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending. We appreciate you being here. And for those of you who are attending the, your very first SafeGraph community event, welcome. Now, before we get into the AMA, I wanted to quickly share some of the benefits of the SafeGraph community um, that the members enjoy. Within our community, we feature great events like this fireside chat. You can get support as you work with SafeGraph data. Our team responds very quickly. Uh, you can share your research and explore other members' research projects. Lastly, we try to create an environment where everyone can network and collaborate. Um, we also have a special offer today for all attendees who can now download $1,000 worth of data, free data from the SafeGraph shop by using the coupon code community exclusive. I'll put all the relevant links in the chat. Just a second. Uh, okay, so our guest today is none other than Dr. Nicholas Christakis, the author of Paul's Arrow, The Profound and Enduring Impact of Coronavirus on the Way We Live. Nicholas is also the Sterling Professor of Social and Natural Science at Yale and directs the Human Nature Lab. Welcome, Nicholas. Great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Sushant. All right, before we dive in, I'd like to quickly cover the ground rules. Um, we'll start with some intro questions. Uh, there are attendees who submitted questions ahead of time, so we'll dive into those as well. And then afterwards, we'll open it up to the broader audience. Uh, everyone's on mute, and uh, please post your questions in the Q&A, and we'll select them from there. Uh, we'll try to unmute you so you can ask your question directly. Um, and then also after the event, we will send five copies of Apollo Zero to randomly selected attendees. I'll start off with a few questions. Uh, Nicholas, you just published two books in the span of two years. Please tell us about them. Oh, goodness. Uh, well, uh, so, you know, I um, my primary job is to be a research scientist. I run a lab, as you mentioned, at Yale University. I also teach classes. I may have a typical professor's job mix of research, teaching, and administrative duties. Uh, but I also, um, you know, for the last, I don't know, 20 years, I've tried to write books as well. And I, I typically write one book every 10 years. And um, I had just finished the previous book called Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society, which I, I would describe as a sort of cross between Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel and Steven uh, Pinker's um, sort of Enlightenment Now, maybe. Um, sort of a, it's sort of a try, it was aspires to be a big book that provides an account for the evolutionary origins of a good society. And the essential set of ideas is that, um, you know, for too long, in my view, scientists have been obsessed with, the, with how evolution has shaped the dark parts of our nature, our propensity for violence and hatred and, and mendacity um, and tribalism, for example. Uh, but the good side had been denied the attention it deserves because equally evolution has shaped our capacity for love and friendship and cooperation and teaching and all these wonderful qualities. And in fact, those good qualities must have and did in my judgment outweigh the bad qualities else we would not be living socially to begin with. And so the book provides, I hope, a kind of sweeping, engaging account of the origins of a good society. And it starts with some nice parts. I have a, one of the things I wanted to do was I, I wanted to imagine if you could conduct an experiment in this regard. And my lab does a lot of experiments using some software we've invented that allows us to uh, link with um, sort of tens of thousands of people can come into our virtual lab and we can, in this godlike way, create temporary artificial societies of real people. And then we can experimentally manipulate attributes of those societies, like how, how unequally is the wealth distributed in the society, or, or how is this, what is the structure of the network, the social network that connects the people in the society. And we can test ideas about how that affects the ability of the society to flourish. So, but I really wanted a more realistic experiment. And what you would love to do, if you could, would be to take a group of babies and um, isolate them on an isolated island on their own and somehow have them magically grow up. And then you might want to come back and see 
know, what kind of social order did they make for themselves? Now, of course, we can't do this. It's unethical and impractical. But people have thought about it for thousands of years, and it's been called the forbidden experiment. And we have accounts going back to, to uh, Egyptian pharaohs of monarchs that had attempted some variant of this experiment where, for example, a couple of babies were given to a, a mute shepherd up in the mountains to raise. Anyway, I thought, well, what would be a proxy for such an experiment? And I hit upon the idea of shipwrecks. And I reviewed the accounts of shipwrecks. There were, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 shipwrecks between 1500 and 1900. I found 20 of them where at least 19 people had been isolated for at least two months. And I read all available records about those shipwrecks. And I, and I begin the book in chapter two with an account of the shipwrecks, which many people find engaging. Anyway, that's blueprints. So I just finished that and was sort of promoting that book when the pandemic bore down on us. And um, I don't know, should I tell you more of the story about how I wrote Blueprint? I've already been too long-winded, I, I fear. Yeah, let's get into Apollo's Arrow. Yeah, so well, what happened with Apollo's Arrow was that I, uh, I uh, had, been, had a long-standing collaboration with some Chinese scientists, and um, we actually had phone data, not as good as the SafeGraph data that we now have access to. Uh, we had some phone data on transits through Wuhan of 11 million people um, uh, moving through Wuhan uh, in, in January of, of uh, 2020. And we were able to use that data uh, in conjunction with certain other information to, um, to uh, develop a model that allowed us to forecast the timing, intensity, and location of the coronavirus pandemic throughout China uh, uh, through uh, February of 2020. And so I, I was really paying attention to what was happening in the coronavirus epidemic back in January of 2020. And I got increasingly alarmed at the way in our society we were, and our leaders in particular, were ignoring it. And this prompted me to want to help bring to bear some experience that many scientists, myself included, for a very long time uh, had about epidemic disease. And that prompted me to want to write Apollo Zero, basically to try to advance the public understanding of science. You know, like what was gonna to happen to us? What's known about respiratory epidemics? What are we going to have to do? What's likely to happen in the end and so on. And so I sort of unexpectedly wrote that book between March of 2020 and July of 2020. And it was published in October of 2020. And the paperback version, which I've updated is coming out in a couple of months. Gotcha. So in Apollo's arrow, you talk about the impact of coronavirus on humanity. What's been the most impressive thing and the most disappointing thing about humanity's response to the pandemic in your opinion? Well, the most disappointing thing I would say is ironically something which has been seen for thousands of years. So, um, which is that, you know, if you think about um, mapping the, um, the sort of human social networks, which is something we do in my lab, and tracing out the flow of germs across these social ties. One of the things that always happens during pandemics is, is right behind the, the spread of germs in these networks is the spread of lies. So mendacity, you know, falsehoods, misinformation. And this has been observed for thousands of years. Uh, there's an account, I don't have it handy right now, for instance, in a, I think during the plague of Justinian, where one of the observers says that all these crazy superstitions started spreading, that if you threw pots from your second floor of your building and they crashed on the street, it would protect your house from infection. And the observer, the historian is saying, this is ridiculous. People can't walk through the streets now because pots are raining down in addition, you know, in addition to, the, uh, to the germ. So the spread of misinformation has, um, you know, has been a feature uh, of epidemics for thousands of years. In fact, you might even say that in addition to the technical biological definition of what it counts to be an epidemic, you might even say there must be some social components. And one of those components you might say, if you wanted to make that argument, is that there has to be lying uh, for it to really be an epidemic. And um, so what has disappointed me, I suppose, the most, both domestically in the United States and worldwide, has been the astonishing and persistent prevalence of um, really ridiculous, uh, preposterous beliefs uh, about it. And it's not just scientific disputes about, for instance, the efficacy of masks. You know, it's beliefs that, that uh, you know, that the, um, that the virus was deliberately released by the Chinese, which is, you know, just very implausible. 
or that you know Bill Gates has put some nanoscale particles in the virus that it's magnetic or something, or or that if you you know even the former president of the United States was saying like if you drink bleach, you know you know Lysol and Clorox had to release statements saying just ignore what the president said. You know you do not drink our products. You know this is ridiculous, uh, really ridiculous um, statement. So that I would say. If I had to pick one thing, that would be perhaps the most disappointing. I said, close to that would be another phenomenon that has been present for thousands of years. And in fact, this is part of what Apollo's arrow argues is that this experience we're all having, which seems so alien and unnatural is actually none of those things. Plagues are not new to our species. They're just new to us. You know, we think this is crazy what's happening, but actually human beings have been confronting plagues for thousands of years. You know, they're, they're in the Bible, um, they're in the Iliad. In fact, that's why it's called Apollo's Arrow, the opening story in the Iliad, which is one of the oldest, if not the oldest written piece of literature we have in the Western canon, begins with a plague. You know, they're in Shakespeare, they're in Cervantes, you know, Don Quixote and so on. So plagues are a part of human experience. And, and in a way, we shouldn't be surprised that things like mendacity rear their ugly heads, nor the second thing, which I think is also disappointing, and then I'll get to the positive thing and then I'll shut up, which is um, blame. You know, the desire to blame others is a kind of persistent feature of epidemics. So in the, in the Black Death in the 1340s, for instance, Jews were blamed. You know, there was this resurgent anti-Semitism. During HIV, gays were blamed, or Haitians were blamed, or IV drug users were blamed. Now with COVID, we see, you know, immigrants are blamed. There's always this desire to blame other human beings rather than to recognize that we're being predated by another living thing. There's some debate about whether viruses are living or not, but for the sake of argument, it's acting like a living thing. Um, you know, we're being predated uh, by another living thing, it's, it, you know, which is awful. And we, we shouldn't take to blaming each other. We can talk about if you want why there's why I think humans do that anyway. So so mendacity and blame are two of the things that are disappointing. On the positive side, and I'll shut up. I think we are the first generation of human beings alive who have been able in real time to develop a specific and effective countermeasure against the virus in a way that might modify the course of the epidemic. Namely, we've been able to develop effective vaccines. And this is truly miraculous. I mean, people in the medieval times, for example, thought they could do something. You know, if you they had these recipes, like you take a snake and you mince up the snake and you mix it with onions and make a paste of snake and onion paste and smear your body with it and that'll ward off the infection, you know. Uh, of course it didn't. Uh, but we have an effective um, way of warding off the infection. I, 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 uh, infection. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that in many ways reflects a triumph of 21st century science and a triumph, I would even say of the enlightenment actually, you know, that we are able through reason and science to develop technologies that save our lives and that we can now do so in, in a, such a rapid pace is I think pretty astonishing. So that I think would be the positive thing that has impressed me. Great, 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 great. Let's uh, get into some of the questions from um, our attendees. So Dan Clor of Vision Media Publications asks, do you believe the idea of flattening the curve uh, will be embraced by the public in the next pandemic? How will time play into this? If the next pandemic is in three years rather than 30, will we be more or less apt to pay attention? No, I think we'll be more apt. I think, I, I think a lot depends. You see, while, while it is the case that you know, plagues are part of human experience, they occur sufficiently serious epidemics, sufficiently infrequently that they are outside of our personal memory. We have written records, we have experts, you know, his medical historians and epidemiologists. We have the knowledge resident in our culture about these threats, but we don't have the personal experience. And so we tend to minimize them. And these types of serious pandemics historically have occurred every 50 to 100 years. Now there's some interesting evidence that they are the interpandemic interval is declining. I should say, by the way, that respiratory pandemics occur every 10 or 20 years, uh, but we're talking about serious ones that occur every 50 or 100. So every 10 or 20 years, we have one. For example, in 2009, we had the H1N1 influenza pandemic. Everyone listening lived through that, but they probably don't remember it because it just gave you the sniffles. It, no one was really worried about it. I mean, they were worried, but it proved to be not so worrisome in the end. 
Uh, but serious ones come every 50 to 100 years. And there's some suggestive evidence that that interpandemic interval is going to decline now, maybe let's say every 20 to 30 years to make up a number. But it's stochastic. So it could come in three years, it could come in 50 years, we don't know. If the next one does come in living memory, I think in response to the question, I think we'll behave better. I think people will remember and they will take better action. And I think with this new mRNA vaccine technology, the government will be able to say, it'll take us six months to get a vaccine. We have the technology and the platform, people behave for six months and then we'll do a distribution of the vaccine. And I think that'll also motivate people. If it happens more than 30 years from now, I think everyone will have forgotten again <laughs> and we'll make all the same mistakes, alas, um, again. Gotcha. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A. How does society collectively make a big decision like candidate for presidential election during an unprecedented event like a pandemic? How does an unprecedented event change behavior, decision-making of a society as a whole? Well, I, there's no doubt by the word how, I thought the caller was gonna ask like logistically, like how do you conduct an election during an, a raging epidemic? And my answer to that was gonna be with care. Uh, now we, my lab has actually done some analyses. In fact, we've actually happened to use some safe craft data, not as the primary outcome, but as a control variable to look at whether the primary, the general election, and a variety of other political um, uh, activities in the last year or two affected the course of the epidemic. We released a preprint that looked at just a tiny part of that already online and had a short essay about that at the 538 blog if you want to get a kind of layman's summary of those results from the primary elections. Now we've done a lot more work since then. So, so I, if they mean how, in that sense, I was going to say like with care, uh, you know, I think we do need, to, you know, society needs to continue, but, you know, we need to be careful. Now, if they mean how does it affect it in the sense of what impact do exigent collective threats have on political processes, uh, that's discussed in Apollo's Arrow, actually, in my book. And the answer is it does have effects. Now, usually if there's a war, for example, uh, or if there is a a hurricane or a famine or a pandemic, these are collective threats. And usually they require a collective response. It's in the nature of such threats that we need a strong public sector, like private center, sector action is, is usually not capable of confront, you know, if an army is invading, it's not individual citizens going to the front that'll make a difference. Corporate America isn't gonna cope with the invading army. We need a state actor to deal with an invading army. And the same kind of thing happens with a pandemic. We have a collective threat. I mean, you can take action on your own. So can many individual citizens, but that's not enough. We need to be organized to confront the threat. And so typically I would say these types of threats um, highlight the importance of the public sector and therefore typically lead to a leftward tilt in politics. Although not always, right? Sometimes you get kind of strongman rule. You know, I, I alone can fix this kind of, and a lot depends on the competence of the government response. So if the government is seen as competently responding, then I think some of the long-term implications of this type of event, including this pandemic, could be a leftward tilt um, in our politics. I'm not 100% sure I answered the caller's question, but those are some ideas. Great. Um... A question that was asked by Martha Rodriguez Galan of St. John Fisher College. Um, how do you explain vaccination skepticism, uh, particularly for populations that may be at high risk of developing COVID? Yeah, I mean, one of the areas right now, there, right from the beginning, there was a lot of concern that um, minorities and, um, and the poor would not get access to the vaccine. And there was evidence that there was either vaccine hesitancy or vaccine maldistribution to such groups. But a tremendous efforts were made to, to avoid that. You know, they, they, they had um, pictures of, for example, minority healthcare workers delivering shots to minority patients. They arranged to have uh, vaccines as, as quickly as possible delivered in a, in a, a you know, through um, CVSs and uh, Walgreens, you know, pharmacies, sort of mom, churches, sort of mom and pop organizations as rapidly as possible, they tried to do this to try to obviate or prevent some of that, um, which is important. 
And what we have now, on the other hand, ironically, is the principal vaccine hesitancy is seen in white evangelicals and in, um, in, re in, uh, in red states amongst Republicans. And, and in fact, they are the groups that, is, as far as the latest data that I've seen, suggest are the under-vaccinated populations who, you know, being our fellow citizens, also warrant outreach. We all benefit. The more people that are vaccinated, the better for everyone. So it's a complicated question as to why and who um, has vaccine hesitancy. Um, prior to COVID, you know, we saw very weird, from my perspective, weird, where you had rich, educated people, for example, in California, that were vaccine hesitant, right? This is not what you usually think of when you think of vaccine hesitancy. And, and part of the reason for this is that vaccine hesitancy is like a kind of luxury belief in a way, or it has become, in the, in, in the case of COVID, quite politicized. Like you signal your membership in a political tribe by the attitude you adopt towards vaccines, which is really stupid and self-injurious as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I have no problem with people having all kinds of political affiliations and political beliefs, and we're a democracy and we resolve our political differences by voting. But why you would mix your political ideology with um, something like this is a bit odd to me, and it's self-injurious. And, um, you know, you can signal your political identity by putting, you know, political posters on your front lawn. You don't have to signal it by saying, I'm for vaccines or I'm against vaccines, you know, as far as I'm concerned. So I think that, um, uh, to answer the caller's question, I think that there has been a sense, an unfortunate way in which various aspects of behaviors related to coronavirus have become politicized in our society, not just vaccination, but also masking, your attitude towards school closures, all of these things. And from my perspective, these things should be decided on technocratic grounds. Like earlier today, I was having a very abbreviated argument because I decided not to keep arguing with this person about, um, about whether, uh, for example, border closures are effective in stopping epidemics. There's, there's interesting scientific literature on this. And from my perspective, all of these questions ideally would be resolved technocratically, scientifically, and not based on ideology. Now, I realize that's a you know, professor's fantasy, you know, <laughs> you know, that will be ruled by philosopher kings. But, um, but um, that's how I would answer that question, you know, that I, I, I think there has been this tendency to politicize these things. It's unfortunate. Uh, I wish they would move their politics to other areas that are a little less important, like what kind of car you drive, for example, or <laughs> what kind of poster you put in your house, let's say. Well, unpacking the, the political angle a little bit more, um, Sohan D'Souza, the president of MIT Media Lab, asks, a sort of ambit claim apologetics equilibrium seems to have emerged among political tribes, especially online, where people who otherwise hold more moderate positions yeah. let slide or play down signaling of extreme, alarmist, and hyperbolic positions within their tribe in expectation of the same happening in other tribes. Is that an accurate assessment? And if so, how do we break the stalemate? I think what he's saying, and I, by the way, I look forward to meeting you. Um, I've you know, been at the MIT, I visited the MIT Media Lab and given talks there, I don't know, every other year for the last 15 years um, and have lots of friends there. It's an amazing place. Uh, but uh, what he's saying, I think is, is why do we give those to our left or right, depending on if you're on the right or left of the political spectrum, why do you give members of your same, more extreme members of your same tribe a pass? And what effects does it have on our society? Let me tackle the latter part of the question first. I think that's really bad for our society. I think that to the extent you can speak up and help police your own tribe and speak up for fundamental principles, the better. So for example, on the issue of free expression, you know, I should be, def I should be uh, opposing I mean, I'm on the left politically, but I should be opposing individuals to my left who are against free expression and not just individuals on my right who are against free expression, because that's a basic principle of our society. And, uh, and I should not like give a pass to those on the left. So like, if those to my left are illiberally demanding the censoring or silencing or disproportionate punishment of people expressing certain political views, I shouldn't give them a pass just because they're in my tribe, right? That is actually harmful to our society. Uh, and so I think the, first, the in answer to the latter part of the question, I'll say, yes, I agree with a questioner that it's bad for our society. I think that one cure is to stand up and be heard and say, no, you know, I, and, and to try to be consistent in your, um, 
in your political beliefs. And I think, incidentally, uh, this is a basic finding from the social sciences, is, is that interlocking identities are what help make a democracy more effective. In other words, in a, in a more pr primitive kind of uh, democratic system, people vote for their, you know, by occupation or by class or by ethnicity or by language or by religion. You know, they have their, you know, it's like Tammany Hall, you know, you have the, you, you beat the bushes and you have your people vote for your guys. But fundamentally, that is not a way to sustain a modern democracy. Uh, what you really need is people that have cross country, cross cutting identities. So like you and I have a different religion uh, and, uh, and a different age, uh, but we, you know, we like the same uh, sports team and have similar occupations and uh, same language or whatever. So we have some things that are similar and some that are dissimilar and there are more such things that there are. And the more we can treat people as individuals rather than as members of tribes, the stronger the fabric of our society and the stronger our democracy. And I think this requires me to be able to say, I agree with most of the things this guy to my left is saying, but not this thing. I don't agree with him on this thing. And that doesn't make me a bad member of the, this tribe. You know, it just makes each person complicated. Anyway, that's my fantasy as well. Maybe a naive political fantasy, but that would be my fantasy about the healthy functioning of our democracy. And by the way, I am very worried about the status of our democracy. And we have enemies who are using modern tools of the internet um, against us. In other words, look at this. The, we, the internet, in a way, is a triumph of our values. It reflects our technological prowess. It reflects our commitment to the free flow of information. It, in a way, it's, like a, it's almost like a canonically Western American even instantiation of our beliefs. And in a very judo style, Putin is of course a judo black belt, he's using our strengths against us. And um, just like they, are, they, they, you know, they gave money to the NRA to weaponize our society, right? They're interested in Americans owning guns because you know, we might kill each other, for example, leaving aside the debate about private ownership of guns. I mean, that's not my point right now. I'm just saying the Russians want us to own guns whether we should or not is a different issue. Uh, or, you know, the Chinese and the Russians uh, using uh, bots and other, and trolls and sock puppets and other kinds of online tools have been fomenting misinformation and pitting us against each other. Now, that doesn't have an easy solution, but, um, but I think it's contributing. So there are many things that are affecting our democracy. First, that I just mentioned, the threat by our enemies. Okay, but that's not even the main thing. Historically high levels of economic inequality are a threat, extreme levels of political polarization where we can't see the dignity of our political opponents. Say, so, you know, I don't agree with this person, but they're not a bad person and they surely don't want our society to fail. They just have a different beliefs than I do. Uh, granting charity to our political opponents. These are important centrist values that I think we sorely need right now, at least in my opinion. Great, great. Uh, one question that we have, from Susan Dietz is, what have you learned from past pandemics and plagues that we might use now to increase rates of vaccine acceptance? Um, do you have any insights or thoughts on how we can curb the markedly increased COVID-19 case rates and hospitalizations in some areas of the US? I mean, it was just announced today that uh, California and some parts of California, even if you have a vaccination, it's a full mask mandate. Um, I'll layer on another question on top of this what do you think should be our priorities for the next six months as a society? And are we in a post-pandemic period at the moment? No, we're not in a post-pandemic period. I mean, I discussed that in Apollo Zero. Uh, I think we're not at the beginning of the end of the pandemic, but we are approaching the end of the beginning. Uh, there are like five different questions buried in these things you just asked me. A uh, first thing I would say is that people have to realize that basically either you will get vaccinated or you will get infected. I mean, that, those are the choices that, um, that you face. And, um, and it's much safer to be vaccinated than to get this germ. Now we're lucky this germ, this germ is a serious germ. It kills about 1% of the people that it infects that have symptoms from it. We now know uh, it's 10 times deadlier than the flu. It is, uh, but it's not as bad as smallpox or bubonic plague or cholera. I mean, it could have been much worse, right? I mean, we're just lucky 
that it's not much worse than it is. We, we could have been facing a kind of bubonic plague catastrophe in the 21st century. I mean, or something like in the movie Contagion, which killed about 30% of the people that were infected with that pathogen. Just imagine, we'd have military delivering food in our city squares, uh, you know, no power because the workers in the power plants couldn't show up to work. You'd be at home in the dark. There'd be a breakdown in civil order. You'd have military, you know, police on the streets trying to enforce order. We, we literally could have had that if by chance the germ had just been a bit deadlier. So it, it, it's, it's not as bad as it could have been. On the other hand, it's not trivial, right? I mean, as an infectious disease, I'm a, I'm a hospice physician, but I have some experience treating people who are infected with diseases. A, ger a germ that kills 1% of the people that infect you is not, is not trivial. So we should take it seriously. So it, you can't, I, I would not be one of those people who says, well, I'll just get it. No. And if you're young and you're hearing this and you're thinking, well, the data show that if you're under 20, you have a one in five or one in 10,000 chance of dying if you get infected, you're right. But on the other hand, if you're under 20, you have a very low chance of dying of anything in the next year. I mean, why would you willingly take on this needless risk? So either you're gonna be vaccinated or you're going to get infected naturally. And it's clearly safer to be vaccinated. A very small fraction of people will escape infection altogether for various reasons we can discuss, but you shouldn't count on being one of those people who can will not get the vaccine and somehow miraculously escape getting infected. That's not gonna happen. So we are not, so the germ is spreading. The new variants are more contagious. They are also more deadly. This is atypical uh, of the evolution of pathogens, which I also discuss in, in Apollo Zero. And it seems to be happening in this case for various interesting reasons. The thing we have to fear the most is that the vaccine will evo evolve to evade our vaccines. I'm sorry, that the virus will evolve to evade our vaccines. Now we don't have evidence for that yet, that, all the variants that have so far been tested, both in vitro and using epidemiological analyses, the, um, the variants lower the efficacy of the vaccine some, but because the vaccines are so super efficacious, the vaccines still confer very substantial protection. But there's some small chance that even though the germ has had a lot of time to evolve and has not yet found a part of the Darwinian fitness landscape that allows it to evade the vaccine, it might. And if that were to happen, that would be quite a serious concern. So, um, so, um, so I've, I've, I've like meandered all over the place in response to that set of questions. I kind of lost track of the central question. What was the first part of the question? Was um, uh, the first part of the question was what can we, what, what are the learnings from prior oh. uh, plagues that we can use to help increase vaccination rates? Yes. So it's very uh, important in public health communication to do a number of things. It's important, first of all, to be humble, to acknowledge that you might be wrong, to provide the evidence for whatever it is that you believe. And, um, and then when you are wrong, to admit it so that you, the people listening to you will grant you credibility. They'll say, this is a guy who tells me how he or she sees it. They tell me why they have this opinion. They tell me their degree of confidence. And I can trust that if they change their minds, they'll tell me why? Incidentally, scientists changing their minds, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this in the public. That's a, that's a feature, not a bug of science. I mean, that's exactly what scientists do. They change their minds. When there's new evidence, they change their minds. It, it's only religious authorities that don't change their minds. So scientists who say, I told you this before, but now I'm telling you this, that's normal, right? That's, but the scientists, we have to believe the scientist was in good faith, acting in good faith at all times. First thing that's required. Second thing, I think it's very important when talking to vaccine hesitant individuals to meet them where they are at. This is basic health communication. So first you start by looking for points of agreement. So if the vaccine hesitant person says, I don't wanna take this vaccine because it was developed super fast and I'm worried the scientists cut some corners. You should say, yes, it was developed very fast. You're right, I can see why you would be concerned by that. And a few corners were cut, but really not too many. Let me tell you what corners were cut and what weren't cut and why the corners that were cut were okay to cut and why we didn't cut the crucial corners. So finding where you agree with the person who's worried is extremely important. And one of the things that's really also difficult is that there's a saying, I forgot who said it, some famous wit said, you can't reason a man out of a position he hasn't been reasoned into. So people who have an emotional response to something can't, don't respond to facts, right? You, you know, it's not like we're having a, 
a debate about how to solve an equation or something. You know, they, they have a feelings about it. And I think it's very important to try to identify those feelings and respond to those feelings. Uh, and it takes time and persistence and patience. So we are seeing, I just saw, uh, I think it was Pew or someone else just released yesterday or today, released some data that's showing that previously vaccine hesitant individuals are changing their minds uh, slowly, which is good. Um, and I think we're gonna have a bit of a tough winter. Uh, I think people are going to, we're gonna have another wave. We always do these respiratory pandemics come in waves. So there is gonna be another wave this coming winter. It's probably not gonna be as bad as the last wave, thank goodness, but we're gonna see a blip. I think we're gonna see hospitals are beginning to fill up again with unvaccinated, typically unvaccinated people, typically with a Delta variant. That'll be in the news. And I think that'll motivate people to, um, you know, to get vaccinated. Great. When McGregor asks, um, you know, he, he mentions that competition and comparison have been uh, very ingrained in society. Um, do you see any shifts in our education system, particularly public education, that lead more towards strengthening underlying uh, understanding of similarities and cooperation um, rather than competition? And then what do you think can be done to move in this direction? You know, if this question is with respect to the pandemic or even pre-pandemic, is a question about is there a general shift in how we educate the young? Or is it a question about how has the pandemic shifted societal attitudes towards competition? Uh, I think it's the latter. And what more can we do to make it more cooperative? Yeah, so this is this is discussed in the book uh, in, in I forgot which chapter, five or six. This is actually an, also an old idea. So people for thousands of years have said, why is it that when we are being brought low by a shared enemy, we fall upon each other? You would think, the reasoning goes, that we would see our common humanity and we would band together to fight the germ. And, um, and there's truth to that. I mean, people do band together to fight the germ. There, we have a shared enemy, a shared suffering. And this is also the kind of trope in science fiction movies. You know, the world, people are killing each other till the aliens invade. And then we all have a kumbaya moment and work together to repel the aliens, right? Because we have a shared enemy now. Incidentally, going back to a point we discussed earlier, one of the theories about why we've had a kind of breakdown in communal spirit in the United States in the last 20 years is precisely because of the decline of the Soviet Union. In other words, once we lost that shared enemy, the bonds of friendship among ourselves um, were weakened because we no longer had to work together to let's say fight the Russians, let's say. So, so this is an old idea uh, and, um, and you would think, and, and so what I would, in response to the question, what I would say is that there's usually evidence of this phenomenon um, and whether that wins out over the more competitive and ruthless aspects of our nature depends on a host of factors, one of which is how deadly is the germ? So um, I think coronavirus is, if it were just a little bit deadlier, I think it would have motivated us to be a little bit more cooperative. But if it was much deadlier, we might have had a break, a complete breakdown in social order. And even now, even with coronavirus, as I discuss in the book, you know, gun purchases peaked at the all-time high of, you know, since records were ever kept back in March of 2020. Uh, people were preparing for a breakdown in, in society, you know, that they thought they might need to be armed, for example. We've seen a bump up in, in murders uh, the last year. It's unclear if that's related directly to the pandemic. Partly, um, we were at an all-time low when the pandemic struck, so this could be a little bit of, you know, regression to the mean in, uh, in, in a violent crime in our society, or it may reflect partly the stress of the pandemic, the economic stress, the social stress, the, you know, the arming of our society and so on. So anyway, the point is, it's a good question. It's been asked before. I don't know the answer. And I'm not sure that our cooperative instincts will triumph over our competitive ones. Gotcha. Um, so Marianne Krisa asks, do you believe there will be another pandemic in the next 10 years? I would and say- What's the likelihood? Well, I mean, you know, if, if the inter-pandemic interval, it, it depends sensitively on the shape of the distribution, uh, you know, but if the inter-pandemic interval has gone from every, 
if the interpandemic interval for serious epidemic pandemics has gone from every 50 to 100 to every 20 to 30, uh, you know, then there is a, a one in three chance, depending on the shape of the curve, that we'll have another one within, you know, our lifetime or my lifetime. Uh, I mean, God willing, I'll live 30 years. But, you know, yeah, I mean, in, the, in, in my children's lifetime, I would say there's an even 50-50 chance that they'll face something like this again. In my book, in, in Apollo Zero, I, I talk about, I think I estimate that there were like 10,000 living centenarians that um, it survived the the um, 1918 pandemic and are now facing this one. 1918 was the, was the worst one we've had in the last hundred years. The, the previous second worst was the 1957 influenza pandemic. This coronavirus pandemic is the second worst respiratory pandemic we've had in a hundred years. And there are very few Americans alive today who were alive for the 1918 pandemic and who are mentally aware of it. You know, they had to have been, have to be compost mentis now and had to have been like five or six back then. So that's when I'm earlier, we were talking about living memory. There's no living memory of these things in our society. They're just written records. And this is again, why people are taken off guard. Incidentally, this is why our ancestors tried to warn us. This is why Homer puts plagues in the Iliad. This is why the Old Testament and the New Testament have plagues, right? Our religious traditions, our literature, our ancestors were trying to warn us about this particular threat you might face that we just endured, you know, be aware. And, you know, we, my Jewish friends during the, during uh, the spring of 2020, my Jewish friends said that during Passover, you know, they had for years been talking about plagues. It hadn't really sunk in until, you know, until the spring of 2020, then it had a different, you know, different salience, a different meaning. And, and you mentioned the 1918 plague. Uh, they had a very, very bad second wave. Do yes. you think that we're going to experience something similar, or uh, where do you think will this pandemic will rank in we, terms we of second wave? We did experience that. So usually, uh, you know, as we just said, respiratory pandemics come in waves, typically seasonal waves, not always, but typically, and and usually the amplitude of the wave declines with time. So the first wave is the worst, then the second wave is the second worst, and it sort of damps down. And by the fourth or fifth wave, we're going to have, by the way, annual waves of COVID for the next few years. The disease will eventually become endemic. That's what's going to happen. Uh, it'll just circulate among us forever. And eventually, we'll all be immunized, either naturally or artificially. Children will be exposed as their new entrance into the population. Children will be exposed. They'll probably have a benign cold-like illness. They'll get some immunity, and it'll this virus will become like other circulating coronaviruses, probably, this is what's gonna happen. Uh, so, uh, and usually these waves have lower amplitude with time, but in 1918, the second wave was four times deadlier than the first wave. And there's some interesting theories as to why that is, which if you want, I can elaborate on. And the second and third waves of COVID have been often worse than the first wave, also for interesting reasons. So this is not typical, but but we have experienced this. I do want to say something which is a bit related to this, and I want to make sure we don't get to the end uh, without me mentioning it, which is that it's very important for the United States and other rich countries to vaccinate the whole world. Now, we have very high vaccination rates in our country. Um, I lost track of the most recent reports of, among adults. Um, but in many states, certainly many blue states, you have vaccination rates of 70 or 80% of people. And if in many red states, unfortunately, the numbers are much lower, 40 or 50% or whatever they are. Uh, we need to get everyone vaccinated. We need to reach at least 70 or 80% of the population vaccinated, ideally, at, at least minimum 50% for something called herd immunity. But the more, the better to have a more functioning society. But it's not enough just to vaccinate ourselves. We've got to vaccinate the whole world because sloppy, slow, or incomplete vaccination in other countries creates a petri dish for the emergence of new dangerous strains of the virus that will inevitably come to our shores and infect us. So my point is, first, in my judgment, we have a moral obligation to vaccinate the world. We're the richest country on earth. We have tremendous scientists. We, it's an opportunity for America to show leadership. There's a soft power benefit I think we have a moral obligation. We have economic reasons to do it, um, which is that you know we need trading partners, we need the global supply chain stood up. We the more, more rapidly we vaccinate the rest of the world, the sooner the economy, the world economy will return to normal. 
And we have epidemiological reasons, like I just said, that vaccinating the world protects us. And right now, a tiny fraction of the rest of the world is vaccinated. And it's gonna take a long time, unfortunately, for that to happen. And the return on investment, I saw some analysis that says, it would, I think it would cost like $50 billion to get 70% of the world's adults vaccinated, 50 billion. And the return on that is many trillions of dollars in economic benefit. It's like such a simple thing we could do. I know $50 billion is a lot of money, but we are spending trillions right now and we could share the cost with other rich countries. So in my judgment, a, a very important national priority for us need, and it's, as I said, it's good for America to look like we are magnanimously vaccinating the world. So, you know, I really think it should be a national priority to vaccinate the planet. And I don't see that enough of that candidly. Yep, couldn't agree more. Uh, Samar Misra asks, is there any way we can make vaccines 100% effective for a serious pandemic? Not to my knowledge. I mean, this, these vaccines are pretty damn good. I mean, I, I don't at my fingertips have information about what vaccines are even more efficacious. There must be a few diseases for which we have vaccines that exceed 95% efficacy. In fact, after this, I'm gonna look this up because I should know offhand. Most vaccines we have, which we consider to be terrific, are less efficacious than this. Remember, you derive a benefit from vaccination in two ways. You derive a benefit when you yourself are vaccinated, but vaccination is a classic network good. You also derive a benefit for when everyone else is vaccinated. So in other words, I get, if everyone around me is vaccinated, there's very little natural infection. There's very little virus. For example, where I live in Vermont, we have 84% vaccination in Vermont. I'm very unlikely to come into contact with someone that's infected because everyone else is vaccinated. And if I do, then I have my own vaccination to protect me. And so vaccines that are 70% effective, 80% effective, especially for pathogens that aren't particularly infectious or deadly are really terrific vaccines and suppress epidemics. So most vaccines that are widely used uh, are less effective. Than, um, than the coronavirus vaccines. The coronavirus vaccines are, are um, unbelievable. There's something else that's very weird about corona, these uh, the mRNA and actually the adenovirus uh, vaccines, which is that usually, this is an interesting idea, usually you are better off getting a natural infection and surviving it. it conditional on survival, having had a natural exposure to the pathogen is usually superior from the point of view of your immunity to having been vaccinated against it. The reason being that if you had a natural infection, your body mounts an immune response to many different epitopes, to many different antigens, uh, to many different parts of the enemy of the virus. So your body has lots of different antibodies against this part of the virus and that part and that part and that part, which is very helpful and effective compared to the vaccine, which is you have a narrower range. Or for example, the vaccines are all spike protein, but the coronavirus is other proteins too, but all most of the vaccines just protect you by giving you antibodies against the spike protein. But one of the very weird things about coronavirus vaccines and very few other cases like human papilloma virus is an example, tetanus is another example, is that immunity acquired through vaccination is superior to immunity acquired from natural infection, which is, is amazing and wonderful. And we're really lucky, it needn't have been that way. Um, so the vaccines induce a kind of super immunity. Uh, so they're very, very good vaccines and we're very lucky to have them candidly. Great. Um, this, this is a question that's been asked by a few people, but what do you think are the long-term impacts of the way humans live? Um, like how we live, where we live, how we work? Uh, will, will the future of work be more remote? hybrid or do we think everyone's going to go back to an office? Eventually, I think everything will return roughly to normal. There will be some long-term changes. This is all discussed in, um, in Apollo's Arrow, if you want more than I can answer in the next two or one or two minutes. Um, for example, it's very typical, just to give you a parenthetical example to that question, it's very typical in times of plague that people um, flee the cities, right? I mean, famously, Newton leaves the city, invents calculus during his 18 months in isolation. Would that we all could, could do that, you know? Uh, 
actually Newton, Isaac Newton invented calculus at the pace at which we are taught it. He invented it in over the course of a year, which is roughly what it takes to, to teach a reasonably smart kid calculus. It's just unbelievable how brilliant that man was. But anyway, uh, so cities empty out during times of plague. There's a kind of deurbanization, and and I and many others forecast that that would happen through this pandemic. In fact, it has happened. It's a very standard response. People flee the cities for suburban and rural areas, but they always come back. Okay, it's temporary. And if you look at the sweep of human history, ever since we invented cities eight thousand years ago, it's been one of progressive urbanization because cities are so exciting and productive. People love living in cities. Even in the last 50 years, we've gone from like 50% of the planet being urban to 80% or something. I mean, it's just inexorable. So, so I think that's temporary. And so many of the things we've seen, I think are temporary, but there will be some persistent changes in our society. And uh, uh, first point. Second point to answer that question, a lot depends on the time frame. So if you're asking me, will be, there be a lot of things different in the next two, three, four, or five years? The answer is yes. There are gonna be a whole bunch of things that are different, including for instance, working from home. But eventually things will return to normal. And this is one of the other messages of the history of epidemic disease is that plagues end, they end. And life eventually does return to normal. It just takes some time. Great. On that note, we can wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Nicholas. It's been a pleasure having you here. For everyone who hasn't already read Apollo Zero, I highly recommend you pick up a copy. Uh, as a reminder, please sign up for our next fireside chat with David Rothschild from Microsoft Research. It's on August 13th. I'll paste a link in the chat. Um, if you're not a member of the SafeGraph community, please do join us. Uh, head over to our website um, and sign up. I'll paste this link. Thank you, Nicholas. It's been a pleasure. Sushant, thank you. And thank you, everyone. I couldn't see your faces, but thank you for having me and bye-bye. And All right. Take care.